the director of Rossums at Research. We are the oldest research institute working on agriculture in the world, actually, since 1843. But uh, I've spent the last 30 years uh, working on various types of agricultural research and problem solving, if you wish, in different parts of the world, in Europe and North America and Asia, and also to some extent in Africa now. So my background is actually as a soil scientist, but over the years I've also been working in other areas. So I have a pretty broad knowledge. And my guest today, or uh, co-person uh, for this uh, live session is Ken Giller and Wachening. And Ken can introduce himself briefly, please. Oh, so um, my name's Ken Giller. I'm a professor of plant production systems at Wageningen University. Um, I'm sitting at home today, in fact, because it's the king's birthday, so it's a public holiday. So there are flags around in the streets here uh, in the Netherlands. Um, my big focus in, in research is uh, smallholder agriculture in Africa. Uh, I've been professor here for more than a decade now. Before that, I was professor at, uh, at the University of Zimbabwe in Harare. And most of my work focuses on uh, rural uh, development in, in Africa. So this week's module in our course is all about uh, agriculture being at the center of uh, sustainable development. And we've discussed that it influences uh, quite a few of these sustainable development goals. So, but what we want to do in this session here is to make this a little bit more concrete. So a little bit of background to this. Um, um, in late 2012, uh, a network uh, was created uh, called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. You can find more information at unsdsn.org. And our first task at that time was to actually support the process of developing the new sustainable development goals in various uh, working groups. And uh, so the first one of the working groups was actually on sustainable agriculture and food systems. And we produced a report in which we offered uh, our thinking on solutions for sustainable agriculture and food systems. And some of that, of course, hopefully had also some influence on the SDGs and their targets as they now emerge. But what's now more important for us is really that question of how to implement these goals and what uh, specific uh, gaps uh, also need to be filled. And so subsequently to this initial work, uh, Ken is now uh, leading a new network, uh, a thematic network uh, under the SDSN that now tries to also pursue uh, specific initiatives in that area. And so maybe my first question to Kenneth, can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the thematic network is about now and what it is trying to do? Sure. So I was a co-author of uh, the report that uh, Akim just showed you, uh, together with many people from all over the world. And um, that was input into the discussions uh, uh, leading up to the SDGs. But now that the SDGs are there and we're, we're needing to try and achieve them, we've got a series of thematic networks under SDSN. <clears throat> and I lead the one uh, which is called the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems, together with Akim and, and uh, Rebecca Nelson from Cornell. So I can... Yeah, we'll come to some of the details now. So one one thing, one initiative uh, that the network is uh, uh, promoting uh, is uh, uh, called the missing middle. Now, most people won't quite know what that means and what we actually sort of try to do there. Can you explain that to what's the missing middle? Sure. So I think this has been a concept that's, that's I think, quite appealing to us in, in, in a number of different dimensions. Um, we've got this very ambitious global agenda of the SDGs. And uh, we know that they're asp aspirational goals that, that they're gonna, gonna be quite hard to achieve. Um, and then we basically, we have a lot of action going on on the ground. It's really everybody's responsibility to try and achieve the SDGs. And the big question is how do we actually link that, that very broad global agenda, which is very general down to actually specific action at local level? And I think this is where all of our participants in the course can come in as well. How do we think what our own role is in relation to this, this very broad global agenda in terms of trying to make things happen? And we think that very often there's a good articulation at global level. There's often a lot of very good local actions, but often they're disjointed and, and there's nothing really 
linking them together. And that's what we're calling then the missing middle. Yeah, I think that's actually a very good description. And I can immediately think of quite a few of those missing middles, uh, even at the level of a research institute, you know, where I sometimes feel that uh, we are very good in generating ideas and doing great, more basic research. But we're pretty poor in translating this, you know, and there's a missing middle even at that level of uh, so. But let's talk about a bit more uh, sort of more development relevant examples. You know? So I think the first example that we wanted to tackle in this session and hopefully also generate some questions from the audience on that later on is uh, the sort of issue of smallholder farmers, uh, particularly in the African context. Yeah. And Ken has been working uh, in this, as he's mentioned, uh, for a long time, including a project called End to Africa. So maybe we start with that as an example of uh, uh, also looking yeah. at the missing middle in that context. So as, as we try and work out a bit more detail, if you like, of how do we address this this concept and how do, how do we try and fill in the missing middle? One of the examples that we're, we're focusing in on, it relates to this project that I lead, it's, it's called End to Africa. And we can give you the uh, the web link. It's just entoafrica.org. Um, and in that, we, we've been working actually now for nine years with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation across Africa, looking at how do we increase the, the inputs of nitrogen fixation, so to boost productivity and to improve soil, soil health and soil productivity, and, and to give farmers a better income. But looking at the grain legume crops, and of course, grain legumes are... Uh, are nutritious, they provide protein, but also minerals and vitamins, and they can really help um, diversify diets. So I think legumes are a great opportunity for both intensification and diversification. So a specific example that we're looking at is in southern Tanzania, where there's a, a burgeoning of, of uh, chicken production. You might ask, well, what's chicken production got to do with, with the legumes? But of course, this chicken production is largely for the, the, the growing urban population, a wealthier urban population who want to eat more meat. And the chickens then are being produced in rural areas, but there's a lack of feed. And of course, so then this is where the legumes come in. So there's a big push to um, boost soybean production together with farmers so that we can... Um, are we, sorry, I can just check, are we still live? Akim's gone quiet. I don't know if I'm still on. Yeah, yeah keep going, keep going. I got kicked out quickly. Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't sure if I dropped out or whether you. No, no, sorry. <laughs> so, so, so we're looking at the opportunity for soybean uh, to be produced by um, smallholders, as it's a real opportunity for them to diversify their production, like I'm saying, and also to uh, to earn money in terms of, of providing this feed into a market for chicken production. So okay. what, what are some, some, some sort of concrete barriers that you have encountered there, some of the sort of missing middle kind that you need to overcome? So at the moment, we, we've got this, in, in a sense, at one side, we've got the productivity push. We're looking at the, trying to look at the sustainable production systems. At the other side, we've got nutritionists looking at, at uh, urban diets and, and rural diets, in fact, and the role of diversifying diets. And what we're trying to do is to, to match the two together a bit in terms of seeing how can we, in, in one way, link the smallholders into the, into the chain that actually leads then to this sustainable production leading to more sustainable diets in, in, in the urban areas. And that, that's, in a sense, the, the, the scope of the, the, the project that we're looking at there. So is it coming down to a more, let's say, uh, vertical integration of uh, farmers to become part of the value chain in a more direct sense, although to actually then also benefit more directly from economically from it? Yeah, so that's, that's one side. At the, the same time, this is an area of Tanzania where there's a strong push. It's within what's called the Southern African, the Southern uh, uh, Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, SAGCOP. And we find a poor link, if you like, between the, the policies which are actually being introduced and pushed from government level 
but there's a poor link between what's going on on the ground and actually the connection with policy in, in Dar es Salaam and with the overhead uh, in terms of the, the government. So we, we're also trying to look at how can we actually in, engage with government to actually um, enable in terms of uh, this uh, intervention to in, uh, enabling policies. Um, one, one big issue for us has been a, a very concrete example. Uh, we didn't have the right varieties uh, of soybean in, in the country. And then if we want to get going with this, potentially we have to wait for three years in order to bring the varieties in to go through a whole testing before we can do varietal release. Yeah. And actually, across the border in, in Zambia, they were already there. So we've been able actually then to negotiate as part of our research with people in the ministry. So it's going, if you like, from bottom up through the ministry to the top to get a permission to actually bring in the varieties early across the border. And then in as part of our project in terms of uh, working with farmers to actually boost product production, that's actually being taken as part of the varietal testing. So we've been able to accelerate these things through the system. And, and it, it, what's very interesting is when you try and get involved in these projects, instead of just doing a test on the research station and saying this is the best variety, but we're really trying to push things out at scale, you come up immediately to these institutional barriers. You know, how do you get the seed? Where's the seed going to come from? How do you get the volumes of seed? And it's that iteration, I think, between on the ground, working back up into policy, working back down, to the local level and then trying to make these linkages that, that that's really the the challenge that we've got to try and fill in so do you feel that uh, to be more successful in this uh, the key ingredient is also that people who who do these activities uh, let's say researchers or national agricultural research and extension systems ngos even uh, need to also engage more early on, particularly with those who are responsible for policies, to make sure that policy making actually advances at the same pace. You know, often we are finding ourselves blocked by that, also because we engage maybe too late or can't explain properly to those who make policies what is actually the right kind of policy. Is it? Oh, absolutely. So what we've what we've been tending to do is, uh, well, we, we set up, a, a, together with others, a, a soybean platform. Mm. So bringing together all of the key parties who are really trying to look at boosting soybean production and including the ministry within that. So we've been able to use that platform as a way of getting these discussions on the table. And we've been able, if you like, to, to do some of the facilitation there, to do some of the initiation of the discussions through our partners, particularly uh, Freddie Bajuki, who, who works with us through ITA in, in, in Tanzania, has been leading on this. And what we realized that that was working well on the soybean part, but then, of course, to get it really well integrated, we're not really working particularly well with the, the, the chicken production side. Mm. And interestingly, there was a, a company came in, quite a big company, um, that was investing very much in... in, uh, in uh, chicken production, but they were in, they introduced uh, uh, the, the very much the broilers uh, chickens, and they were actually rejected by the market because people want uh, they, they don't like these. They say that in Tanzania they're not tasty, both in urban areas and in rural areas, hmm. and they want a more a more rustic chicken breed. And so they've <laughs> actually had to go back to, to square one really because the price of uh, that they were getting for their chickens was so poor. And so, again, it's another example really about pushing an idea without having a very good uh, yeah. engagement with the market. <clears throat> so we're working now together with the, 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 the people on the, on the chicken production side because, of course, the we have to look at the feed requirements, feed processing from the soybean, how that then goes into the chicken, how the chicken's marketed. And rather than thinking, in fact, in, in this idea of a linear value chain from production right to consumption, you realize it's it's actually really is a a network of of interacting players yeah, yeah. this whole food system with local markets and urban markets um all being actually we've thought at first the local markets would be the rustic chickens and the the higher mm. chickens for the urban markets but actually 
all of it's now moving back towards these more rustic chickens, which of course don't grow in quite the same way and they need a slightly different production system. So mm. I, I think it's, uh, for me, it's one of those issues where you, you do your very best to analyze the problems ahead of time. But it's only when you get down and really get engaged that some of these uh, unexpected things pop up, which actually then cause you to have to rearrange and redirect how, how you're working. And maybe yeah. that's linked back to policy. <clears throat> I think is really an essential part. I mean, one thing that concerns me a lot, also based on my own experience, and uh, is that in, in, in research in particular, in science, if you wish, you know, we tend to often work in a much more uh, specific or, or isolated manner on only specific parts of that kind of complex system. You know? So, um, and I think it's often also depending on uh, how you can get funding for your research, uh, which tends to be more of the shorter term kind and pieces. Yeah, of well, we've, been, we've been very lucky in that because we've actually been able, we've had now, we're in the ninth year of funding uh, from, from the Gates Foundation, which has allowed us to actually build lots of new relationships and actually get new funding going on with partners because we're there, if you like, for the long term. And, you know, going back to it, yeah, what's our role? I mean, of course, our role really is, as the start is, is looking at rhizobium, you know, the bacteria, looking at the inoculants, looking very much at the agronomy of the production method. And of course, we've got to get good production, and that's a really essential part for us of the contribution of, of, of that. Uh, agronomic knowledge but then of course that agronomic knowledge is of no use unless it's built into this much broader system and we end up working yeah. further and further away if you like from our comfort zone but always trying to bring in the experts that we need from the different fields. Yeah it, it, I think it requires uh, uh, effective ways of collaboration and also sharing of resources and expertise and also I think for many funding agencies uh, uh, requires a bit of a rethink in terms of uh, how to support the right kind of uh, work, you know, because if we continue with short-term little projects here and there that are disconnected, I don't think we'll be able to come up with uh, uh, practical solutions of the kind that we need. You know. well, we, we were discussing this yesterday, actually, because, um, you know, very often <clears throat> when we write a research proposal, you have to more or less say what the results are going to be in yeah. the beginning. In order to get the to get the funding, when of course, really research should be about generating new ideas and actually finding new things, and 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 in a sense, the whole idea of you write a proposal and you give out what the results are going to be from the beginning, it doesn't really fit in with the whole idea of research. So yeah, I think I particularly in these sorts of areas, we we need funders who are going to give us enough space to change direction, and 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 some donors are very. Um, they're very aware of this, I think, and allow you actually at the end of each year to revise your objectives and to revise your budgets and to change direction when it's needed. And I think that's a, an essential part of the role of knowledge in development, that we have to be much more, uh, well, we have to be proactive, but we have to be reactive. We have to be able to, to, to look at things in a very reflexive way and, and, and build forward. Yeah. You know, I completely agree. I mean, this is something that, that is concerning me greatly. Uh, in, in science and science funding have become, in my view, too sort of bureaucratic in a sense that you're expected to plan three or five years ahead what you're going to deliver in terms of milestones and outputs and whatever. Um, that actually favors what I would call incremental research. It does not favor uh, sort of a more of the innovation type that could lead to uh, a more substantial new solution. And so I'm particularly keen also to have more freedom from, from that angle, though, but innovation in a use-inspired sense, so not just sort of scientists mm -hmm. cooking up things just because they like cooking up things. You know? so it has to be use-inspired, but also with the necessary freedom and lean mechanisms, I would say, without a lot of bureaucracy that allow you to very quickly come up with a few prototypes of a solution that you can then subject oh. to the testing with the right kind of users and then from there iterate or improve, you know, and, and spin out into various directions because there's never going to be just one solution. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I think the, that whole idea, though, of, of involving users in the research right from the word go is absolutely essential. And that's, you know, I think the, the example of the rustic chickens is a good one. You know, otherwise you're pushing a, a company actually in there pushing something which isn't going to uh, take off in the market because they didn't really get their market research right in the first place. If you like. mm. we, we've got a contrasting example, maybe I, sh I should mention as well with, with colleagues. It's not when I'm directly involved in uh, so much myself, but working in, uh, in Vietnam where it's, it, you know, in, in Africa, we're dealing with this problem actually of, of poor productivity and really needing to get inputs in fertilizers, inoculants to get fertilizer boosted. In Vietnam, it's a bit the, the, the uh, opposite end, where particularly there's huge concern now in the consumer side and urban consumers about the way that their food's produced because of the rampant use of, of agrochemicals and in particularly in, in, in terms of the use of um, uh, pesticides, insecticides, and, and, uh, and fungicides, and the like, and really severe problems of contamination in, in in those vegetables going into the urban markets, where people are starting to to reject them, and and so there's an issue there of of actually going back from you know a system which is highly productive and farmers are making lots of money, but they 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 really need um, re-educating a bit in terms of knowledge of how to use these uh, these inputs in a much more sparing way in more in integrated pest and disease management in order to be able to then match that back to, to, to this you know, insistence that's coming back from the from the consumer side and uh, and of course there's a big gap in between between the producers and how those vegetables then are marketed and get into the uh, the urban market so that people in urban markets can be actually confident that what they're buying is, is actually coming from a, a good source. So when you look at a case like this, uh, uh, that probably would also involve a, a much stricter level of regulation, I think, of pesticides. Exactly. I mean, regulation is, is clearly uh, important at one end, but it also comes back to, I think, a very key issue which, which comes up in all of our discussions around sustainability in, in agricultural production, which is one of traceability. Mm. Uh, last week, actually, I was in uh, I was in Indonesia in Sumatra with uh, with Unilever on a, a, an advisory board, where we're looking at they're they're committed to 100% uh, uh, certified sustainable palm oil in their uh, in in their value chains uh, within one year, in fact. At the end of 2019, for for all of the the crude palm oil going into their production lines, and actually, they've got another target for for another type of oil. But but for them, um, this whole idea of certification is one way of achieving sustainability. But that means also you need traceability right back to the place where the product's being produced. Mm. And and I think that this is something that's going to come out more and more in future. It applies very much in Vietnam because there needs to be traceability back to source because otherwise what is uh, very, if you like, clean production, sustainable production is going to be mixed up with other stuff by the time it gets on the shelves and then the consumer is not going to have trust. I think it is my impression in general that uh, uh, because of the uh, changing preferences of consumers worldwide and it's not just in, in sort of the rich countries of the West it's also emerging in uh, at least in pockets in, in many of the developing or transition countries you know, a, a desire particularly of the younger generation I mean probably started with the millenn millennials generations already but the, the next one already now I think it's called generation Z or something like that uh, people generally um, wanting to have more assurance of uh, higher standards for how food is being produced. So I think we will see more of, uh, I don't know whether there will always be certification schemes, but at least uh, the implementation of reasonable standards for the production of food driven by what consumers want to see as a higher mm -hmm. level of transparency. I mean, I think the certification is, 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 uh, has been very useful and will continue to be very useful in some settings. But there's a general acknowledgement that it, it can't be the, the only approach. Yeah. Because 
uh, it's expensive as well, and it adds a, an extra layer of bureaucracy and cost into, into yeah. the production. So there are other ways of going around it, around uh, good ag good agricultural practices, you know, gap the farmers signing up to uh, particular ways of production, which are then actually regulated and controlled, so that it's not just a, a free for all. But where people are looking at um, this whole idea of, of uh, continuous uh, improvement in practices, because I, I always say sustainability isn't something you can reach and then sit back and think, oh, now I'm there. It really has to be a, a, a long-term goal that you keep to strive for. And, and we never actually reach it because we can always do better. And I think that that is, is an important conceptual idea that we, we, we should be looking for ways of helping people always do better. Great. We, we have, uh, before we uh, start answering some questions that are coming in, uh, we have um, in the course uh, right now uh, a little uh, activity called the Foodathon. So can you tell us about this yeah. one a bit? More? So, um, this year in my university, it's actually the 100th uh, uh, year of, uh, of our university, and we've got a quite a big uh, conference coming up uh, in September. It's a conference called uh, about SDG2 called Towards Zero Hunger. And as part of that, the students uh, groups in, in Rafning have been organizing what they call a foodathon. So it's built on this idea of a sort of a hackathon that we get <laughs> groups around the world uh, coming up with their own uh, uh, ideas of, of potential solutions. And so it's going to be a bit of a competition uh, people are asked to form uh, local teams, four to six people uh, living in the same country or region. And, and some of the discussion groups we've got on, on the uh, course could be a basis for this. And then to look at what's a critical challenge in the food system and what could be a potential solution. And then basically by putting in these, these ideas of, of proposals uh, by actually closing dates in June, June the 10th, so during the, the course, um, the three best local teams will actually be invited here to Wageningen to actually present during the, the conference. The conference is actually on uh, the last couple of days of August, not September, sorry, it's uh, the 30th and 31st of August. So there's an announcement um, there uh, with details of, of how to join, but we really encourage people to, to uh, use the course as a, a basis potentially for coming up with your own teams uh, to join in in this uh, foodathon that will actually take place over the time of the conference. Well, that sounds very interesting. I, I'm convinced personally very much to, that uh, loads of people have very good ideas. And sometimes they're small ideas, sometimes they're big ideas, sometimes they're outrageous ideas too. You know? But that's exactly what we need, you know, uh, people or teams of people who come up with some really innovative practical solutions at whatever level that is, you know, in their own environment. You know, that's the only way to make progress. So I think well, it's I think, a great opportunity that fits in very much around the discussion we're having now. How do we fill in this gap between the global agenda and local action? So let's uh, see some questions are here. So I have a first question from Simon Taylor. Uh, I don't know where Simon lives, but uh, his question is: um, Is some of the problem of the missing middle knowledge transfer? Uh, also between academics and producers, but also between between producers. Yeah. Very think, good. <clears throat> well, this is a good one, and um, one of the questions we're being challenged with always is, you know, it's fine working in in villages with small numbers, but how do you actually reach the millions, if you like, with, with through your projects? And you know, we, we're we're dealing with projects which are already working with say twenty, thirty thousand farmers in places, and. Um, I think this idea of knowledge transfer is a, is a very important one because obviously um, you know, we've got the academic literature which academics write for and, and often I don't think academics are well enough engaged in activities such as our, our course to actually try and communicate that knowledge more broadly. One of the things we learned in Tanzania uh, as a specific one is we've been working with Farm Radio International and uh, CABI, the um, uh, Gabby in, in uh, Nairobi, looking at different ways of getting knowledge out. And, and so we've been using radio as one thing. What was great with that was in order to get a, an agreement on the radio messages that were going to go out as part of these, these programs around our 
uh, producing more legumes, we we actually had to come to an agreement about what was the content of, of, of the programs. And that actually meant different projects and different government institutions coming together to actually agree on some of the things where there were quite disparate opinions. So it, it worked very well as a, as, a, as a process of bringing people together, as well as uh, communicating knowledge. And of course, using that and, and finding out with Farm Radio who's then listening and getting their feedback so using it radio actually is a medium with a with a, a two-way where we can get the producers feeding back information and questions and we're feeding out information and trying then to couple in between the agro dealers who are then if you like the people who are taking the products out to the farmers and then marketing and buying the produce back so i think knowledge transfer is a, a, a key one and it'll remain one that's that's actually quite hard to do. Yeah, I would actually, uh, I often prefer calling it knowledge exchange because it has to go in both ways. Uh, yeah, so, so one one concern that I have uh, uh, that uh, the way how modern science nowadays works, we have large numbers of scientists who work in, let's say, agriculture related disciplines. You know, be it genomics or molecular plant sciences or even soil metagenomics or whatever it is, we have large numbers of those who are highly skilled, highly uh, specialized, uh, but there were very few of them actually spend enough time visiting farmers to actually sure. put their research uh, into the right context. And that's where it really starts because I believe very strongly that anytime you visit a producer, a farmer, and it doesn't matter whether that's a a big scale commercial farmer in America or in England or a small little farmer in Africa or Asia. It doesn't really matter. Uh, every time I visit one of those, I learn something new. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm going to read the next question to you because I think it's one that you, you should try and answer first. So it's from uh, Mina Mosele, who works at the Ministry of Agriculture uh, on food processing technology to address hunger and nutrition, malnutrition. And the question is, commercialization of new technologies developed by research is difficult because there's no funding for startup companies to actually mean that the new technologies yeah. are not transferred and taken up producers. So, so how do we deal with that? That's another missing middle. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, I can talk about this from the Rossumstead context because that's a problem that we often face. So we work a bit more on the upstream end of science, but we do come up with uh, certain inventions, uh, uh, also intellectual property, and then the question always comes up, well, what do you do with it, you know? So, you know, you always hope that somehow somebody comes to you and says, well, you've come up with a really interesting idea here. I would like to license it or take it and do something with it here. But often this doesn't quite happen, you know? So first of all, you need to go out and kind of market it properly, you know, to, to actually find the people who, who uh, may, uh, be the right people to do something with it. But I think what is often missing too is uh, scientists themselves, in certain cases, should really go all the way, you know. They shouldn't just stop and say, I've invented this thing, now I go back and continue my research, you know. I think we need more risk takers also who are willing and say, okay, I'm so passionate about this, I'm so convinced of what I've created here, that I'm actually going all the way that I'm taking the risk uh, and I'm going to try to create a startup company, a spin up, you know. And I think the, the question right now, is creating three of those ourselves, yeah, uh, for various types of things. Yeah. So one is a non profit and two are would be for profit. And in each of those cases, you run into the problem that the uh, question is asking where do you find the, the startup funding for it? You know, how do you do it? How do you deal with the IP? Where do you find somebody who can develop a business plan? That's not something that scientists know about normally. You know? So I think the experience that we have is that, uh, first of all, institutions, and it doesn't matter what institutions they are, need to be willing to support that uh, as much as they can and encourage it. Then a lot is already possible. Uh, I think uh, if you have really good ideas, uh, and they are proven already, at least in the pilot stage, to work in the field or wherever the application lies, 
it is often feasible to find then uh, some investment to get keep going. So, but we need to go that step, that initial step, that initial step of the translation, and that requires institutional support and mechanisms. So this is not easy to do, uh, but at that level, I think it's still a responsibility of the organization to actually support that. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do wonder whether a wide enough startup culture in the agricultural sector yet is not as developed as it is in some other industries, like in the medical sector, for example. But it's emerging, and uh, we see actually in quite a few countries now incubators for uh, for startups and different types of models uh, uh, emerging. Uh, some driven by industry, so Bayer Crop Science, for example, has uh, uh, opened up recently their own startup uh, incubator in Sacramento, in California. Some uh, by public organizations. So I'm hoping that this becomes more of a movement to actually enable uh, more. Uh, entrepreneurs to take their ideas into forming startup companies. So mm -hmm. it's a relatively new, but I think it's necessary as part of the process of finding solutions for commercialization. So, a couple of examples. I was in Singapore on the on last Friday, in fact, and uh, Unilever have, have actually got a startup lab there where uh, I think they got 20 or 30 different companies already involved. These are, partly in, in, in different parts of the food chain, but including food processing uh, and the like. But, and, and also, I know the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in, uh, in Nigeria, in Ibadan, has a, an yeah. incubator, like, you know, business incubator, where they try and actually look at uh, spinning off uh, technologies from the institute. But I guess what we need really are, are, are governments in every country to start thinking about this and getting there uh, alongside their universities and research uh, uh, facilities to have some incubators and, and some that can attract both private funding and maybe some public funding to actually go into uh, spinning off some of these ideas. And that's a very good point. I think access to easy access to public funding is critical for this. And this is difficult in many countries uh, because governments tend to play. Mm -hmm pretty strong also for auditing reasons or restrictions on how money can be spent you know yeah. uh, I think they need to change the way they do this we have a question from Deepak Sharma uh, how to bridge well I guess the gap between the thoughts going around on SDGs and grassroots level practical practitioners what are the potentials for farmer led research programs well, I mean, think this is uh, uh yeah, and another it's a key. It's it's another missing middle, isn't it? It's very much in in a sense where we we started out, um, and I think uh, you know I think farmers are researchers by nature. They're often experimenting and and doing things themselves, but often in a, a not a particularly uh, coordinated way. Obviously, um, I'm I'm actually uh, a believer that that there is a role for formal research as well, and it's actually the connection between formal research and farmers research that we need so not i mean i think having farmers certainly in the lead of problem identification but i think the formal knowledge networks have really got something to contribute when it comes to the problem solving as well i mean one one uh, example on this that we're also looking at from our sdsn network it relates to uh, pest and disease control because we've got a lot of farmers, particularly in, in northern Nigeria uh, and um, parts of West Africa, but I think this is also occurring in East Africa. It's been noted more in, in West Africa, where they're using a whole range of different uh, chemicals to try and control different pests. But unfortunately, when we then go into the detail of what chemicals are they using, they're often the wrong chemicals. They're, they're, they're often um, not well described even on the package of as what their, their, their use should be sometimes actually in in uh, in foreign languages there's, there's quite a dumping of chemicals coming from china um, yeah. and and there's a danger there i think of having farmer led research without a good link back to more more formal research systems because we can probably get away with much much less use of agrochemicals and much more effective control if if we actually have that fusion of knowledge, so you know, I think farmers' knowledge is absolutely essential. But I, I wouldn't go over to, to leaving it all up to, to farmers, to be honest. 
I have two examples that are relevant for this, uh, and both are from, from our work here, uh, but they can be done anywhere. So the first is a thing that we are just about to launch called Farm In, or Farmer-Led Innovation. And uh, uh, with a little bit of money we got from the commodity boards in the UK. And the principle there is that um, a farmer or a group of farmers will have an idea, and they have plenty of ideas. <laughs> But they don't know exactly how to go about testing it, you know. So they'll put forward the idea, and uh, a, a scientist or a group of scientists uh, who are interested in participating in that will partner with them in designing, in simple terms, a, a, a little research project around this and how to develop that idea, how to test it. And the, a very simple, unbureaucratic panel uh, says yes or no. Yes, go ahead, do it, and you get a little voucher with a bit of money to do it. And you can basically do quick innovation, typically within a six to 12 months period, you know, to develop your thing, to test it. And the only rule that we have for that is that whatever you find, whatever results you get, you must freely share with anybody else in the world, <laughs> any other farmer. You know? So that actually others can benefit directly from that little investment and innovation that was led by a farmer. And the second Thank example you. is more of the Very sort good. of farmer, farmer to farmer kind. I see this often happening now also through social media. So uh, just to uh, take an example, a concrete one, a, a local farmer here about two years ago decided to completely convert his farm into no-till farming, with, including cover crops during winter. So to do this, you had to buy a pretty sophisticated new machine, a cross-lot drill from New Zealand, you know, to be able to plant crops into uh, dense uh, res crop residue or even standing uh, crops. But uh, his machine operators didn't really know how to use this yet. They've never used a thing like this before. Mm -hmm. But they started using it. And uh, what he did is he set up a Twitter account for both of his uh, tractor operators, who also didn't have Twitter before. And they started tweeting about their experience with this machine. And they were quite proud that after a few days of operating it, they had brought down the diesel consumption per hectare or per hour to what they thought a great level. And they tweeted about it. And then immediately got responses from farmers in New Zealand and other parts of the world saying, well, guys, this is good, but this is still far away from what it should be. Nice. You need to do this, this, and this, and this, and you can do much better. So they told me afterwards that uh, within the span of about six weeks, they learned much more in terms of practical experience and fine tuning the operation of this thing than what they would normally uh, probably yeah. have needed about two or three years for, you know. So I think yeah. these are just sort of simple examples where farmers can, themselves can actually be great innovators and also interact uh, with researchers and themselves. Yeah. So Deepak Sharma has a follow-up to say, how can we coordinate farmers' research to convert it into common knowledge? I mean, you give one example there yeah. of using modern media. And I think this, this if we think about the smallholder context in, in Africa, then we are, we are often diff dealing, obviously, with, with people who are much less well-connected. And, and really, uh, farmer organizations of, of one or other form tend to be really key to actually getting farmers together into big enough groups that they can share knowledge. And those can be cooperatives or commodity groups. Um, but we, if we think of some really good examples around the world, I think for me, one of the best is, is, is actually the way things are organized in Australia. Because in Australia, they still have levy funding from all of their um, they're different crops, and they have an organization, particularly the group called the Grains Research Development Council, which um, actually gives out money to the researchers. So the researchers at the universities and CSIRO get their funding from a body which is funded by the producers, and the producers have a lot of say in determining what should be in the research program, so together with advisors. And there, you've got a very, very good integration between the demands from um, the producer side and the the funding for research. And I think that actually leads to some fantastic innovation because it, it gives a, a very close working relationship. In the Netherlands, we used to have what they call the product organizations, which was something similar around different things in horticulture or flowers and bulbs and things. 
And our government in here in the Netherlands very wisely scrapped that completely. <laughs> We've lost that connection, which I think was actually an extremely useful way of organizing research. And so maybe, hopefully, we might get it back at some point. I think there be, um, to, to add a bit more to this, so there's obviously uh, one level of coordination that is more at the grassroots level, what farmers can do together as a group in terms of learning and innovating. You know? So a bit of self-organization guided by a researcher or an extension worker. And there are good examples of this. And I think the most efficient way of, of generating knowledge and sharing it is always through personal interaction, not through social media. I'm convinced that the human interaction is uh, the number one mechanism. Uh, wow. So, but there are then the higher level sort of uh, almost political or structural coordination measures of the kind that Ken already mentioned. I'll give another example, or maybe two actually. In Denmark, uh, the, the farmers associations own Zegis, which is essentially the uh, single organization which does applied research and extension and advisory services in an independent manner. So it's owned by the farmers associations. So the farmers basically decide what it does, what kind of applied research it does for them, you know, also through 30 local offices. It also does independent testing of new products. Uh, so and training and other types of things. You know, so, but it's owned by the farmers essentially. You know. And in Uruguay, uh, they have a very unique system which uh, uh, was created quite a few years ago. So uh, farmers by law uh, pay a levy on uh, all produce you know, and the government has to match that income one to one. Uh, and so the pot then is twice the size and all that money goes to one organization called INTA, which does all the research and extension work. And uh, on the INTA board, uh, you have strong representation from the whole industry, including farmers too. So you ensure through that that you have uh, a source of funding that allows you to do research. It is tied to success. The more successful farmers are, the more money actually goes back into the pot. You know, And you have uh, the ability to, to, to actually direct the investment in a coordinated manner to those problems that farmers uh, and the industry as a whole believe are the most important to tackle. Yeah, time's running on and I see that there's an there's a, a recap question here, uh, which goes back very much to the, the basis of uh, the, the course content. Um, and then maybe you want to kick off uh, first What's from that's for sustainable yeah. agriculture. Oh, yeah, uh, and he's asking, what are the key pillars for sustainable agriculture? It seems a very simple question. Uh, <laughs> I think if you, if you ask this question to five different people, then you get five different answers. Uh, but in principle, I think it's the, the, the general desire to produce food uh, in a productive, uh, say, uh, environmentally friendly, resource efficient and safe manner. You know? And then the safety of it uh, also means consumers want to have food that is free of any kind of contaminants, uh, uh, but it also uh, often then in the livestock sector in, in particular uh, into it also aspect of animal welfare. You know? So, I mean, this is a very generic uh, uh, definition, uh, uh, but uh, I think every country has to figure out what their past before this is. I was just earlier this week at a conference in China I called the Conference for Agricultural Green Development. You know, so, so China in particular now is very interested in greening its agricultural sector or its rural environment as a, as a complete uh, package, realizing that uh, the intensive way of doing farming is causing too much trouble. So in their case, it's largely about transforming the sector towards yeah. uh, less or overuse of fertilizers and pesticides, uh, having better crop rotations, greener crop rotations, improving the recycling of things, of waste and of manure, uh, but also green industries uh, uh, attached to the agricultural sector that also then provide job opportunities for farmers mm -hmm. because you also actually have to displace some small order farmers to aggregate farms into bigger sizes. Yeah. You know, so these are some Another dimensions. Big, yeah, I, I just uh, yesterday finished teaching a course on, on analyzing sustainability of farming systems. 
and uh, the concluding uh, words for me are well you know now we know it's really difficult you know um but i think most uh, people would say that for these key pillars we talk about the three p's you know people planet and profit but obviously sustainable agriculture has to also provide the, the living income for the farmer but uh yeah, I mean, I think Akim's point is a key one that, that depending on what your starting point is, it, it depends, uh, that determines really where the, the big focus has to come. Uh, and and in, in my course, in fact, I, I absolutely refuse to give a definition. Mm. I get the students to basically talk among themselves and to come up with keywords and we create a, a word cloud around it. But, but the things that come out always are, are these ideas of not compromising the environment for future generations. But I think we, we, we shouldn't just be conservative and try and not compromise. I think we should be thinking about improving the situation for future generations as well. And sometimes these ideas of sustainability can be very conservative. You know, sustainable development is that an oxymoron? We need development, and development means change. So it doesn't just mean keeping the status quo. So we we get some very good debates around this, and I think um, among around those general principles, it's very good for every individual to try and sit down and think. Well, what do they think? What's your own personal definition? Rather than us saying, you know, here is the answer, because I think. You know, it is a very, it's very much, sustainability is very much a personal journey in many ways. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, the, 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 the policies being discussed right now in, in terms of the future of agriculture are all framed under the much bigger, uh, um, for the public perhaps even more important question of uh, uh, what is the future plan for the environment. So yeah. farming is part of the environment planning, and we have a 25-year environment plan now, and, and under which, essentially, agriculture is a key component. You know, so but it just sh shows you the different priorities. Yeah. Now we have a difficult question. I'm not sure whether Ken and I are the right ones to answer that one from Amponsa Brobi. Free trade among the African countries will be a plus and a boost to sustainable agriculture on the continent. What is UN current stand on the Africa's free trade policy. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're not the UN. And, and <laughs> for them directly. But I, I do think uh, there's, there's a, a lot of discussion about uh, creating a, uh, an African tree, free trade community in the same way that, you, you have, let's say, the European Union. And I think an important part of that actually is to potentially is to put up some some trade tariffs and barriers a bit around Africa so that Africa can uh, be more dependent on their own production. We see very much um, one of the biggest problems for producers is not necessarily having a fantastic profit, but having a stable price so that they know at the beginning of the season what they're going to get at the end. And I think for, for smallholder producers, this is an absolute key. We've seen over the past few years, particularly since the price peak uh, of, of commodities around 2010, the general prices have been going down. And, and this has uh, led to some very promising initiatives in Africa falling away because of the dumping of, of cheap produce on the African continent. And, you know, a, a particular one that, that goes back to an example I had earlier is the, the import of a very cheap uh, soybean cake meal for a livestock feed. It's very easy for a producer simply to order a container from the port rather than to worry about the aggregation of smallholder production. And I think putting in some uh, tariffs for importation could actually favor the, uh, the building of a more sustainable local production which can meet those, those markets. So I do, I do believe that this issue of, of uh, free trade, but also uh, considering actually competitive advantages of, of the very big producers versus the small producers is a, is a really key issue for development. But I think it would, uh, from, a, from an African point of view, it would make, at least it seemed to me, it would be very sensible to have uh, pretty much a free trade policy within African countries or the continent as such. You know? yeah. <clears throat> because, uh, uh, I think just based on the uh, realization that no country really can produce all the different things that are needed, 
even from a biophysical point of view, you may not have uh, everything that is required. You know, so trade will always be part of uh, uh, the food security policy as such. You know, so it's more of a question of how much can you produce with what, what's what's your resources, you know, and then how can you uh, make sure that you can have a, a trade system in place that allows you to have stable, reliable, affordable access to the other things needed and at the same time also enables you to export things that you can produce mm. to others. Yeah, exactly. So another so, very critical. We're, we're running uh, we're running out of time I think yeah, I can there are a couple more uh, yeah let's have a look here. Uh, 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 Vaswa Ferguson from Rwanda, I have a problem, I think he means in developing countries, how can we achieve zero hunger without uh, a high budget? Well, yeah, dif difficult. Um, I mean, obviously we know we've got a burgeoning uh, rural uh, uh, population as well. And, and uh, I think particularly in Rwanda, Rwanda is a, a country we've I've worked in quite extensively. Uh, we recognize, you know, the, the, the problems of high, high density of populations and very small farm sizes. And I do think that, that um, in the same way that European farmers get support from governments uh, through the common agricultural policy, that we need a way of supporting smallholder farmers in Africa to be able to produce the nutritious food needed in the cities. But I, I think that's, that question's a bit too big for us to go too deep well, into. I think there is a, uh, uh, I think what countries, particularly developing countries, uh, need to always keep in mind is that they do not underinvest in the agricultural sector. You know? Absolutely. So, because uh, it is an important part of the development pathway, particularly for the lower income company, countries. And of course, there's always the tendency that uh, the money is in short supply and you want to uh, spend it on health, on education on this and this and this you know but uh, under investing in the agricultural sector over the longer term will make it harder to actually achieve progress and i think uh, there's often a figure that is being thrown around that if i remember it correctly that uh, low-income countries should at least spend about 10 percent of their gdp on the agricultural sector or something like that you know so so that maybe the last couple of ones, Deepak Sharma come, came back and, and now when I mentioned this course, could I share some notes on analyzing sustainability of farming system? Uh, now, I, I just taught a six week course on this, so it's a bit hard to, uh, to summarize uh, very briefly, but I, I'll certainly, uh, we can put some materials on, on, on uh, the chats that, that you can have a look at. Yeah, and awesome. A concluding remark here, here really is a point for us to finish on from uh, Olivin Angelis at IRI in the Philippines. Is it right to think that to address the missing middle, we have to invest more time on policy formulation using inputs coming from both farmers and researchers? And I think that's maybe just a, a really nice comment and, and uh, something we should take away with us, that the idea of bringing together people from different uh, sides to actually formulate policy together is probably a, a, a very important way of trying to bridge these gaps. Yeah, I would call it policy innovation, uh, almost in an iterative manner, uh, and in a more participatory manner, and that would be something really great, because then it will actually work. <laughs> so time is up. Yeah, time's up. So, so please uh, continue the discussion on the chats, uh, on, on the, uh, the course site, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again in future. So. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Cheerio.